Hey y'all, coach in the fight here. Head facilitator of Hermes Academy, where our theme is the repairers of the breach. We are the repairers of the breach, repairing the paths to dwell in. And we understand that that path goes through the feast days. So as we do every year, we spend a lot of time doing a lot of classes related to the feast days, pulling out as much information on the feast days as we possibly can, helping people to understand when they are, what they are, and what we're supposed to be doing on those feast days. Now we're in the Pentecost season. We're in the third month, the month Sivan on the Holy Calendar. We're approaching the middle of the month when the Feast of First Fruits or Pentecost or Shavuot is to take place as we understand it now. And so we're talking about the Feast of Weeks. And in this class, we want to talk about what it is. What is the Feast of First Fruits? What is Pentecost? We hear a lot about this holy day as people tend to get excited around this time each year. You hear Pentecost this and Pentecost that. But what exactly is it? Where did it come from? Why is it so important? What are we supposed to do on that day? So in this class, we're going to go in and we're going to look at that. And to do so, we're going to actually use the Dead Sea Scrolls this time. We haven't looked in the Dead Sea Scrolls yet, but we got a comment from a viewer that reminded us of the Dead Sea Scrolls and how it contains information concerning the first fruits. And so we're going to go in and we're going to actually look in the Dead Sea Scrolls and pull out tidbits of information on what the Feast of First Fruits is. Now, this class is going to be a little bit disjointed because if you know anything about the Dead Sea Scrolls, you'll know that it is a lot of books. It is a volume of books all lumped up into one book that we call the Dead Sea Scrolls. In other words, there's a lot of different texts in here, different texts, just like our Bible has 66 books. Uh, I haven't counted them in the Dead Sea Scrolls, but it's close to 66, if not more, individual scriptural documents in there. And so what we're going to do is we're just going to look for the word first fruits. Maybe we'll look at another word if the video doesn't get too long. We'll look at um, when the word first fruits is mentioned in the Dead Sea Scrolls. And then we'll use the text that we find as a backdrop to discuss what the Feast of First Fruits actually is. Now, normally I don't do so on my channel. I avoid talking about myself because I don't find it to be modest. I really don't have anything to brag about in the first place giving the father all credit and glory for anything that I've accomplished in life but I do find it a little bit necessary in this class to explain or at least give you a hint as to who I might actually be especially when you get into the first fruits and the Dead Sea Scrolls the reasons why will become more obvious as we go but even those who have been around my channel for a little while may not have heard some of this information, particularly how I am a Levite. I am a firstborn male of Hebrew descent. I've actually done my DNA and my haplocode is E1. You may not know what that means, but that actually shows that I am a direct descendant of Abraham. Not that that matters too much when it comes to being a Levite because we understand from the Old Testament that in order to be a Levite, the requirements of being a Levite 
is to be the firstborn male in your family. So that means that you know several Levites. The father designated all firstborn males of every family, humans and otherwise, to be designated as his possession. We belong to him. That's every firstborn human. Women would have many of the same traits. They just don't have the possession on their lives as the males do, as he designated the firstborn males. In other words, back there in Egypt, when he was killing the firstborns, the firstborn females would have been spared. But this is not only humans, it's every animal, every dog, every cow, every goat and sheep. The firstborn males belong to the father. So in other words, you know many Levites. Think of your older brothers, your cousins, your uncles. Even your firstborn male children are actually Levites. Now we understand in the scripture somewhere it says that at the age of 12, they actually become men. That's where that whole bar mitzvah thing comes from. But we understand at the age of 20, these firstborn men become soldiers. They join the army of the Most High. But then at the age of 30, they come into what's called the priestly order that we learn over here in the Dead Sea Scrolls. Or that we hear about in the Dead Sea Scrolls. We actually learn about that over in the Torah. That at the age of 30, all of the firstborn males, ages 30 to 50, actually supposed to take on priestly responsibilities. In other words, they're actually supposed to become priests. Now, you're probably thinking, uh, my older brother or my uncle or my dad who's a firstborn doesn't really act like a priest well that is because they may have not been anointed there are preparations that one must make and much of that comes with studying of the scripture. So in other words, if they haven't been on the job, if they haven't been doing what they're supposed to be doing, then they will not be holding the offices of the priests as they should. But they still have that calling on their life. They still have that responsibility on their life, even though they may be out there doing the things of the world. So when you look at the firstborn and take a minute and think about who they are in your life. When you look at the firstborn males around you, especially the ones that are put between the ages of 30 and 50. Look at how they are having a hard time getting and keeping a job. Look at how many of them are having a hard time conforming to the world, to the beast systems of today. Many of them are in prisons. Many of them are in other institutions. This mainly is because they are struggling between being a person or a man of the world who the world understands them to be and being a man of God, who the Father expects them to be. And so it makes it a little bit more hard on them than others. But like I said, I don't like talking about myself. So let's finish that little blurb up so I can get on with it. I am a firstborn male, age 49 years old. In other words, I am in my last year of the priesthood. 
even though I had no idea that it was going on. It was only after about 15 years of serving the Lord that I actually understand what it means to be a Levi and went back in and actually looked at how things played out in my life. And what I found is that the Lord put me in a Levitical role exactly right on time, if not a few years early. But like we said, there are many, many, many Levi's around you. Every firstborn male is a Levi around you. Every firstborn male who, have, is, who is of the age of 30 to 50 is supposed to be a Levitical priest. The only question is, do they have the anointing? Now, I can't speak to that. Because nor have I seen, nor was I expecting to see that anointing process to take place in my life. So I'll leave it up to you to decide if you think I have the anointing or not. There's really only one way to tell. And if you can't tell, I probably don't have it. But anyway, let's go on. Let's jump down here into the first fruits. So like we said, we're going to do a search and we're going to look for the word first fruits. Now, like we said, we're coming out of the Dead Sea Scrolls and I'm working from a digital copy of the Dead Sea Scrolls that I found on the Internet. I think I Googled this a few years ago, Dead Sea Scrolls, and I found a PDF version of the Dead Sea Scrolls. Now, I do have a hardcover copy book of it here sitting beside me, but you guys can't see it. And using this digital copy here is going to make things a little bit more difficult for us to understand what book we're in. So, if there is any additional information that we'll have to pull out, we'll do so later. Right now, I'm just going to skip the part where I try to un try to tell you what book we're in, even what verse we're in, um, because that would actually make the video a lot longer as I would have to go back and find those books and stuff. If it's important, we'll go back. Otherwise, we'll just go and see what we got in here. All right, let's jump right into it. Not sure where we're at. Not sure what book we're in, what chapter we're in, what verse we're in, but we're going to start right here where it says... And when they shall gather from the common table to eat and to drink new wine from the common table shall be set for eating and the new wine poured for drinking. Let no man extend his hand over the first fruits of bread and wine before the priests, for it is he who shall bless the first fruits of bread and wine and shall be the first to extend his hand over the bread. Now. This is the first thing, if we were writing this down, and we probably should be, the first thing that we understand about the Feast of First Fruits is that it is a harvest celebration where they are blessing the first fruits of the harvest. So what's going on is on the date of first on the date of first fruits, the date of Pentecost, that 50th day, which falls on the day before the Sabbath day. People were to bring their offering or their first fruits, which is the offering, into and for the priests. Your first fruits is simply the first of what it is that you are producing. Now, in modern day society, it seems like the only thing that we produce is money. And so that's why a lot of times people expect our tithes or our tithes to come in the form of money but that's not the way it was in the olden times and that's not the way it will be in the future after the tribulation your first fruits will be anything of the first that you get for instance if you are growing vegetables out there in the field the first fruits that actually come up out of the ground are supposed to be the best whether it be tomatoes or corn or whatever it is 
And so you get those first fruits and you actually take them to the priest. Now, we are supposed to do this all the time, not just around first fruits, the feast of first fruits. This is what we're supposed to do anytime we get anything. I read in one place, if you get a bottle of wine, the first portion of the wine is supposed to go to the priest. Remember the Bible says, tells you to forget not the Levi. So the first portion of the wine is supposed to go to the priest. If you go get a loaf of bread, the priest is supposed to get part of that. This is actually how the Levi's and the priests are supposed to survive. See, they have a calling on their life. That means they're supposed to serve the Lord, period. They ain't supposed to be out here trying to serve mammon and trying to hold down jobs and careers. Their sole responsibility, the Levi's and the priest's sole responsibility is to read the scripture and tell the rest of us what it is that we are supposed to know. They, supposed to, they are supposed to know when the Sabbath day is, what it is that we're supposed to be doing on the Sabbath day, when Pentecost falls, what it is that we're supposed to be doing on Pentecost. They're supposed to be the guys that we go to whenever we have any type of scriptural question. The same way they went to Moses out there in the desert. Moses was of the tribe of Levi. That was his responsibility to be the answer guy. And that's what these guys are supposed to be doing now. They're supposed to be dedicating their life for the service of the Lord. And you say, well, where, where are they supposed to get food from? Where are they supposed to get you know, clothes from? Where are they supposed to get the things that will sustain them and their family's lives if all they do is read scripture? Well, the way the father set it up is that the common man, us common people, would actually bring our first fruits into the priests and for the Levites. Whenever we went to the store and bought a pack of socks that had 10 pairs of socks in it, we would take one pair of socks and give it to the Levi. Whenever we would buy a dozen eggs, we would give at least one of those eggs to the Levi. We would constantly be carrying stuff in for the Levi, providing him with the stuff that he needs to survive in order so he can serve the Lord and he can serve us. This is the way it was supposed to work from the beginning. And this is the way it will work in the future, too. We're just going through a period of time right now where, you know, humanity is a little bit off track. And we're basically telling our Levi's that we want them to get jobs or whatever. And they're doing it. They're running out here trying to serve man. And nobody's really carrying the word of God and telling us what we're supposed to be doing. And before I move on, let me add another thing to this. While we are convincing the Levi's, the ones who have the responsibility to serve the Lord, to tell us what the Bible says, to be our interpreters, to be our preachers, while we're telling them to go off and get jobs, we are hiring other individuals to go into our churches and actually teach us the word of God. In other words, none of those guys down at the church are Levi's. Statistically speaking, I say that because I've asked them. I've asked a lot of them and not one of them yet has fit the requirement of a Levitical priest. But yet they are the pastors. Yet they are the bishops. Which kind of explains why we may be a little bit off track that we are is because we're listening to the wrong people. But I'm going to get on before I get myself in trouble. I try not to put down anybody out there just trying to do the work of the Lord. But I do find it necessary to tell you the facts of how things are supposed to work in here. So uh, please excuse me. Let me go on. It goes on and says, Thereafter the Messiah of Israel shall extend his hand over the bread and over all the congregation of the community shall utter a blessing each man in order and of his dignity now like I said I'm not sure what book this is I may have to go and look and see what book this is in because it's actually talking about the Messiah but we recognize that the Dead Sea Scrolls were written before the Messiah so this is actually a prophetic verse here talking about how the Messiah would actually 
what does it say extend his hand over the bread so he would extend his hand over the first fruits so we asked did he actually do this well my first thought is that this is exactly what he did especially since he was the first fruit he was the first of the first fruit this is exactly what he did we could probably do a whole class on that but let's stick to first fruits let's go to the next time we see first fruits listed here there's not that many of them okay now in this section of the Dead Sea Scrolls it appears to be telling us the timing of the Feast of First Fruits and we've covered this in many classes because everybody wants to know exactly what date the Feast of First Fruits falls on and we've done plenty, plenty of classes and we've done a lot of digging into a lot of scripture and it boils down to about the 14th day of the month Sivan which is the third month so we won't get into the timing of it too much in this video unless it tells us the exact day but let's look at how it says right here they are the first fruits to Yahweh wheat bread 12 cakes two tenths of flour in cake the 12 tribes of Israel so what we're gathering from this is that all of this bread that is being talked about on first fruits is symbolic of the 12 tribes of Israel that we see here we saw a few minutes ago that the Messiah would be putting his blessing over those loaves of bread and now we see that those loaves of bread represent Israel then it goes on to say they shall offer their grain offering and drink offering according to the statute the priest shall wave wave offering with the bread of the first fruits again it is during the feast of Pentecost this is the main day this is one of the like I said we do it this all year round but this is the most important day that we bring the first fruits in and have and present them to the priest now it says that they're waving it but they ain't giving it back the priests aren't giving it back we will give them these loaves of bread they're going to wave these loaves of bread and then guess what they're going to do with them next they're going to put them over with the stockpile of bread that they have received from everybody else that went before us. This is an offering to the priests. This is an offering to the Levites. See right there it says they shall belong to the priests and they shall eat them in the inner courtyard. This is how the priests ate food. This is how they got food. They weren't out there tilling like the rest of us. They got their provisions from us. Now, I don't want to read all of these verses. I'm reading a little more than I normally would want to, only because this is the Dead Sea Scrolls, and a lot of these are fragments. You see how it has these brackets around words? It's because these are fragments, and many of these letters are actually missing in the text. The Dead Sea Scrolls is a little bit harder to read than most books because of that. And a lot of these books, they just leave whole paragraphs of stuff out and you have to try to figure it out what it's talking about. But anyway, we see right here in this passage, it says, On this day there shall be a holy gathering and eternal rule for their generations. Meaning that it is a responsibility that we're supposed to do. We were never supposed to stop this. You say, well, how and when did it stop? Why did they stop doing this requirement here? It was actually stopped by the Catholic Church. Remember the Messiah? Those guys were participating in Pentecost. The disciples, they went on to do Pentecost after, Messiah, after the Messiah was gone. It wasn't till the year 312 AD that a guy named Constantine came to rule and actually took over what was then the Christian church. He took it over, renamed it the Universal Church or the Catholic Church, which means Universal Church, and he changed some of the rules. One of the main rules he changed was who were the priests and what was considered an offering in other words they didn't want bread anymore they wanted money they wanted cash 
And so the popes hired priests, sent them out to the different parishes or to the different communities with the sole responsibility of gaining this tithe's money now. It's not bread anymore, it's money. And that's how they built the Vatican and Vatican City and all their other elaborate church buildings. All right, now look at this part right here where it says, they shall do no work. So the Feast of Pentecost or the Feast of First Fruits is supposed to be like a Sabbath day where you do no work therein. That's the case with all of the holy days. We know you're not supposed to do any work on uh, unleavened bread or the Feast of Tabernacles. Well, this is no different. It's a little bit different because we'll find out that they are sacrificing animals on that day, which is something that you don't do on the Sabbath day. But we also learn that Pentecost was the day before the Sabbath day. Pentecost is to the 15th day of the third month as Passover is to the 15th day of the first month. Think about that for a second. Passover, we made a sacrifice and then we went into a high holy day, the Feast of Unleavened Bread on the 15th day of the month. Well, Pentecost falls on the 14th day of the month which we can deduce that actually the 15th day of the month could be a high holy day. And then when you consider how they got the tablets, the stone tablets of Moses on the 16th day of the month, it helps us to understand what's really going on here. But like we said, this part is talking about the timing. See even there it mentions the 50 days. And it's not really talking much different than what the Leviticus 23 says about it. So we won't go into the, in detail about that part of it. But look how, how we're saying a new wine for a drink offering. So they're doing bread offerings and they're doing drink offerings on Pentecost. Now, what's unique about this year, 2020, is I actually have some homemade wine in there this year that I have been saving for the date of Pentecost. We got to make some blackberry wine this year and I have been saving it for this date of Pentecost. We've made the bread offering before. So you can find videos where we've presented our two wave loaves. But this one will actually be able to present drink offerings. Uh, and again, that's what Pentecost was about. It was about after I, being a common man, had went through the process of growing the wheat, harvesting the wheat, harvesting the berries, making the wine, making the bread, will now come in to the Levite, to the priest, and make an offering to help him so that he could continue to help me to understand what the scripture is saying. And letting me know what it is that I'm supposed to be doing. Alright. Let's go on to the next time. Now here it is. It's talking about the oil. So you have bread, wine, and now they're talking about oil. Now back in the days. And even still now. They grew olive trees. I just found out we can grow olive trees. In this part of the world. And it's actually really easy to make oil. And you think that may not be a big deal. That's only because we buy our oil today at Walmart. But if you know anything about our family, you know that here on the Hillbilly Homestead, as we call it, we have been living off grid since 2015. We have been trying to learn how to survive off of the land. We've learned to produce most of our food, but there's some food items that are extremely hard for us to get because we can't produce them ourselves, like sugar and salt. But oil is actually one of the main ones. Maybe your mom does or the person in the house who does the most cooking knows how important oil is. But for the rest of us that only come to the table when the food is ready to eat, we have no idea how important oil is for preparing meals. You have to use oil almost every day. Maybe we all should think about getting some of these olive trees. 
If y'all want to send some of them olive trees down here to the hillbilly homestead, I'll give you the address. But anyway, what well we learn here that they're actually offering oil to the priests on the Feast of Pentecost. So you can imagine these people have been growing these olive trees, taking care of these olive trees, gathering these olives, pressing out the oil, storing it in bottles, and then on the date of Pentecost, they would have carried this into Jerusalem where they would have found all of the Levites and the priests gathered in one place and they would have made this huge offering every year. And like we mentioned a few minutes ago, we're also still supposed to be doing this and we would still be doing this if it hadn't have been for interference from the Catholic Church that changed the rules. They changed who the priests are and they changed what the offerings are. I remember back in 2014 when I was leaving corporate America, I went down to the pastor of the local church and I offered to make a donation of flour. I was telling her how the scripture was pointing to the tribulation and how we were going to go through hard times and how we were going to wish one day that we had a storehouse of food. How the Bible says we're supposed to have a storehouse. The church is supposed to be the storehouse. How one day we were really going to wish that we had a store that that storehouse with food. And so I offered to purchase and deliver thousands of dollars worth of flour so it could be stored in that storehouse. And that pastor told me, no, they didn't want the flour. They wanted money. You can see here that this oil was used for the lamps in order to keep the tabernacle lit there. But again, the purpose of Pentecost was actually to make these donations. We see here in this portion of the book, when it comes to first fruits, how a portion of the, um, uh, the courtyard was supposed to be a place for them to store their first fruits. We see here in this part that they're offering wood. Like we said, the priests were totally dependent on these people making these offerings each year. But now notice this part down here. This is important. It says, from the feast of first fruits of the corn of wheat, they shall eat the corn until the next year, until the feast of first fruits, and they shall drink the wine from the day of the festival of wine until the next year. What this is talking about, if you look over in the book of Leviticus 23 and chapter 14, is telling them how they should eat neither bread nor parched corn nor green ears until the same day that they have brought an offering unto your God. This is talking about first fruits. Now, I've spent a lot of time trying to understand what it's talking about here. Now, and the way that I understand this is this saying that from the time we start the Omar count, those 50 days leading up to Pentecost, we're not supposed to eat bread or flour or corn. Those grain items are not supposed to be eaten for those 50 days until we get to first fruits. And then when we get to first fruits or the date of Pentecost is when we can start eating bread. That's why those, you have those two loaves of bread that are given their own Pentecost is because that's the time to start eating bread again. And that's why people get so excited about barley harvest and all of that kind of stuff. But we'll save that for another class. But it's on the Feast of First Fruits that they start eating bread again and they will eat bread all year long until we get back around until the beginning of the feast of first fruits and it is a little bit confusing here how it do how it does is how it uses the word first fruits two times but if you look at Leviticus 23 it doesn't really give you a name for that other feast but see how Leviticus chapter 23 verse 10 calls the beginning of the 50 days first fruits so that's why it's a little bit confusing because we understand that the Feast of First Fruits falls on the date of Pentecost, but we see here that this is a First Fruits Harvest celebration too, so it's like both of them have the name First Fruits. But from but what I understand, and you can you can add in the comments if you if you have a different understanding, 
But for what I understand, we start eating bread on the date of Pentecost and we'll eat that bread until we get to this day right here that's talked about in verse 10 of Leviticus 23. And then it will be a 50 days where we won't consume any bread. Because we have to remember that it is a harvest celebration. And I believe that that's adding to the experience of the harvest day celebration. The fact that we're harvesting all of this corn and wheat and, and barley and stuff is that we have been abstaining from it for so many days leading up to it. It's like a beautiful day that we actually get to eat bread and corn and stuff again. Maybe even get to drink wine again on that day. It's saying here the festival of wine. I don't know much about the festival of wine. I may need to go study when that is. But that might have something to do with first fruits as well. If you know about the festival of wine, please mention it in the comments below. But for the sake of this class, let's go on. Try to understand what it is that we're supposed to be doing on first fruits. Now, I'm not really sure what this is right here. You can read you can read it if you want to get some understanding. It's talking about a woman uh, consummated a marriage, and I'm not sure if this has anything to do with the uh, feast of first fruits or not. But I will point it out. First of all, it's on the list when you want to leave it out. But see how it's talking about the right of the firstborn? Firstborns are different. Firstborns are different. You know, it's, it's not really anything to brag about. You know, you, we had nothing to do with the fact that we were born first in our family or whatever. And probably nothing to do about if we're actually obedient to what the firstborns are supposed to be doing. But I mention that to say that you have firstborns around you. It is like the Father has given every single family a priest inside their own house whether it be your daddy your son your brother or you somebody around you has this calling on them now like I said we're just looking for the word first fruits here and it's talking about the fruit trees that you plant on your property are like the first fruits so when you move on to a new property one of the first things you want to do is plant fruit trees and what we learn in the scripture is that the first three years of after planting these fruit trees, they're actually considered uncircumcised and you're not supposed to eat them. And then in the fourth year, you're actually supposed to give them up as an offering. And that's what it's talking about here. The fourth year, you, you know, whatever trees it is that's bearing fruit at that time, you would give it to the priests. Like I said, that's the responsibility of the Levite is to know that kind of stuff. That's our job to know that. And that's kind of why we get shunned so many times because we're like walking Bible encyclopedias. Again, here talking about how the first fruits are to be waved by the priest before you eat it, meaning you're supposed to give the priest part of the first fruits before you consume it. And you think about, you know, people who spend a lot of time in church they hear about tithes all the time how that's supposed to be the first 10 percent of your income well the catholic church that's that's what they're basing that on the protestant church of course has gotten it from the catholic church but that's what it's basing that on is these first fruit contributions too bad we're giving it to the wrong priest these days but those days are coming to an end we're actually going to give it back to the people that's supposed to get it here come shortly see this is what Malachi chapter 3 is talking about over here um, we hear about this a lot of times when that offering plate goes around in church um, verse 8 uh, says will a man rob God yet ye have robbed me but you say where have we robbed thee in tithes and offerings this is what it's talking about here you know when we don't give the priests and the Levites what it is that we're supposed to be doing to you know what we're supposed to be giving them we're actually stealing from the father he remember he put those guys here he put those people in our fire in our in our lives in order to carry out his mission and the way he provided for those people to do his service 
is for them to receive tithes and offerings in order to keep them up and by us not giving them that tithes and offerings we're actually stealing from the father but if you read Malachi like I said you see that that's all coming to an end that's that's not the father knew that that was going to be the case and it is today you know nobody's really um, recognizing the Levi's we've forgotten all about the Levi nobody even knows who the Levi is or cares about the Levi anymore even though the Bible tells you in several places do not forget the Levi we have forgotten him but there's coming a day when you know that's not going to be the case anymore here it is again telling us that we're not supposed to eat of bread until the feast of first fruits gathering all of that grain into the harvest bins before we actually start to eat of it because you can imagine that grain and stuff would have been getting ready you know and people would have been you know eating it and then it wouldn't have been no big deal everybody full on bread by the time you get to the feast of Pentecost everybody fat and happy and it's like oh we got more bread to eat well here is something interesting um, I'm sure this information up here is telling us where this is actually coming from. If somebody knows how to read the Dead Sea Scrolls, maybe they can help us out in the comments section. But this around here says, Prayer for the day of first fruits. Remember, O Lord, the feast of and the pleasing free will offerings which thou hast commanded to bring before thee the first fruits of thy works. Amen. Now, again, this is the Dead Sea Scrolls, so this is just a fragment. You see where it says uh, FR? That's just a fragment, so the rest of this has actually been lost. Now, here is something called the Blessing of the Priests. It mentions the word first fruits down there, where it says, He gave you as your portion the first fruits. Um, I'm not sure what all this is in here, but I'm hopefully I can put it in a way that you can actually see this whole thing if you actually want to read it it does mention Zadok up here for those who know about the Zadok priest so we understand that the feast of first fruits is all about making an offering to the father's people now I do recognize there may be diplomats from different organizations religious organizations out here that will be listening to this class like I said Hermes Academy tries to reach everybody and so the way you make these offerings may be a little bit different than you know other people for instance when it tells you to sacrifice bread may mean one thing to one person and it may be mean something else to another and that's fine I believe what we understand out of this is that Pentecost is all about making that offering. 